Good morning, Hildor. How are you this morning? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Uh, as you know, I'm Keith Fiveson uh, with the Center for Wellbeing and also uh, head of the Work Mindfulness Project. And I'm so delighted to be here with you hosting uh, Yen at 10, Your Environment Now, and uh, really learning about how we can uh, impact the environment in wonderful ways uh, physically for ourselves, but also for our community at large. And I know we've got a great show today that really touches on that. So can you help us a little bit? Tell us what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, I think uh, one thing that really drives my work is to encourage uh, mutual respect uh, with, uh, in the animal kingdom in terms of uh, uh, getting to know our non-human relatives. Mm. And, and I, I really enjoy uh, especially teaching children and, and finding out who the last common ancestor is and, and the fact that we actually share DNA with birds and whales. And, and there is a, a, a information within me that's in the bodies of, of my, my relatives, my distant relatives. And, mm. and perhaps that's why bird song feels soothing. It's a reminder of where we came from. Right. And um, in terms of being an advocate, I am absolutely thrilled and honored to have the time of Dr. Carl Safina, who wrote um, what's now becoming one of my favorite books, Becoming Wild. Oh, am wow. I turning it upside down today? No, it looks great. So how, <laughs> just hold it there for a second. Hold it yeah. there for a second. So a uh, little down, a little back so I can see the cover. So it says how animal cultures raise families, create beauty, and achieve peace, becoming wild. I love that. I, love I, think, that. I think it's a much needed uh, reading for our times. Right. Um, it's, it's also uh, about time, I think, that the human species uh, learns a little bit of humility mm -hmm. um, and humility of the earth, humus. Uh, is, it's in the word human. Uh, and it starts with... Um, understanding what animals think and feel. And that's what uh, Dr. Carl ha has been uh, writing about. And he has, he had the Safina Center. So I want to hear about his work. He actually has a book that's uh, both written for adults and children. I, I haven't, I, I just ordered the one for my children uh, about how animals think and feel. I was once in a, um, field trip with my daughter in Queens and they were showing the children, the school children in second grade, where milk comes from. And mm. part of the project was to go to this poor cow that was tethered to a pole mm. and hadn't moved probably in her lifetime, her body structure. I grew up in Iceland and, and had family members on farm. So I know what a healthy cow looks like. This cow was uh, you could just see they had injected with hormones for the milk production. Mm. And uh, the children were supposed to go out there and touch her udders. And she had open wounds with uh, blue uh, salt, I'm guessing iodine or something mm. to keep it from getting infected further. Bugs all around her, it was really hot. And I got so mad that my daughter is uh, still today mortified to take me on field trips. Mm. <laughs> but I, I, was, I, I, I went over to the teachers and I just insisted that that's not the way to teach my child where milk comes from. That's mm -hmm. abuse. That's animal abuse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's so prevalent in our culture. And if we just took the time, and I, I grew up without screens other than the big screen and by the sea. So I had close encounters from, you know, as, as soon as I learned to crawl. I have great respect for animals. In that field trip, one of the moms said, what do you care? It's not like cows feel. And mm. I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? You have a dog, don't you? And a cow is a larger mammal, right? Mm. So uh, people seem to understand that dogs have emotions, <laughs> but then everything else is sort of like there. And so I'm here to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Carl Safina, who hosted the PBS series on saving the ocean. Mm. and uh, has written several books and um, really is the person to talk to in terms of culture, um, mm. what mm. we can learn from animal cultures mm. and why so, we're in such dire straits. So 
So, so wonderful. Doc, Dr. Safina, doc, uh, Dr. Carl, how, how, how would you prefer us to call you? Just Carl, or how, what would your preference be for our show here today? Well, whatever you come up with, I've been called worse, I assure you that. <laughs> you can well, just call me Carl. Carl well, you're, you're a very compassionate man, and I want to thank you very much for bringing your compassion uh, here so that we can really uh, start to work on that uh, and really understand that uh, without compassion, our world is uh, in trouble. So uh, yeah. uh, please tell us what you know. Well, I'll try. Um, we're going to talk about the book that Hilder held up, which is called Becoming Wild. Mm -hmm. But before we get to that, I'm going to just show you the cover of another book that Hilder mentioned, which is this one, Beyond Words. And this is about cognition and emotion. In other words, what animals think and feel. Hmm. And um, following that, a subset of animals, um, a subset of animals have culture. Now, what is culture? Culture is the habits, traditions, behaviors, attractions, and preferences that are learned and are passed along culturally. They're, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> socially. Culture is, is the, the habits, traditions, um, preferences, attractions that are passed along socially. So we, we learn them from our elders, starting with our mother usually, and then with our uh, social group that we grow up in and then also we learn it from our peer group. So that's what culture is. And many animals have culture. They have things that they must learn from mothers and from peer groups. So for instance, chimpanzees have to learn, you're supposed to be seeing chimpanzees here. Sorry. Beautiful shot. We're not, we're not there yet, unfortunately. We'll get back to that one. No, I, I'm screwing this up somehow. No, we're seeing not the screen. All. We're no, seeing it. your screen. Are you, but you're not we're seeing, seeing, you're not seeing, seeing the, chimpanzee. the mother and the child. We don't see, we see the mother and the child, but we don't see we, a group of we see, if that's We see Nora, Nora. You see, Nora you see and the Nora. mother and the child. That's interesting because that is not what I'm seeing. Okay, so it's working for you and it's not working for me. How odd. Um, anyway, the chimpanzees are very cultural other creatures and young ones have to learn everything from their mother. They, they learn what food is, they learn where food is, they learn what is dangerous. They also learn all their social skills. How do you greet others? How do you act uh, to show deference to dominant individuals, all those kinds of things. One stark way of understanding how important culture is for many other animals is to deprive them of culture and then try to set them free. So if you have a chimpanzee that's been raised in captivity and you brought it to chimpanzee habitat in Africa and you just opened the crate, that would be a doomed chimpanzee that would die. And we also know that from, I mean, some of us have experience of having, uh, for instance, uh, a parrot escape, or maybe you've seen a parrot in your neighborhood. Without their social group and without growing up, knowing who they are because of who they're with and knowing where they are, they, they are doomed. If you deprive them of culture, they cannot survive. So culture is a crucially important matter of life and death for many animals, including humans, of course. Humans, human child could be raised in any culture on earth. Humans are very, very cultural. We have many cultures. There were many more cultures. Cultures are being simplified and are going extinct. Um, and a human child could be raised in any culture we could be raised as reindeer herders, or we could be raised as uh, seal hunting Inuits. We could be raised as uh, monkey hunting Peruvian or Brazilian rainforest people. 
but once we are of those cultures, we cannot be just transported and dropped somewhere. You can't take somebody from the Amazon rainforest and drop them in, uh, in Lapland or, or on the shore of the Arctic Ocean and expect them to survive. They, they wouldn't be understood. They wouldn't have any idea what to do. They, they wouldn't know what food is, all these crucial things. So these are, these are basic aspects of all cultures, human and other. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, I'm going to go a little further now by reading you a passage from the book. There are, I guess there are two things I'm trying to accomplish with my writing. One is to acquaint people with other beings on this planet that we don't know very well. We may, we may know their names and we think we'll know, oh yeah, I know what a chimpanzee is or I know what a sperm whale is. But most of us, in fact, have no experience with these creatures and, and actually know almost nothing at all about them. So I'm trying to help acquaint us with who we are living with here on this only living planet that we know of, this miracle in space. And the other thing is I'm trying to give you um, some perspective on, on the habitat that they are in. And I, I do these things by going to the places, um, cheating by being with the scientists who have studied them for the longest amount of time, usually. People who've studied these creatures from anywhere from uh, 20 to 40 years. And they give me a crash course while we're actually there in the place and observing the creatures. So the, the first creature in the book, there are, there are three species in the book that I focus on, although there are dozens that make cameo appearances. But the first focal creature is sperm whales. And the setup here is that I'm in the Caribbean off an island called Dominica mm -hmm. with a scientist named Shane Garrow. And we are listening for sperm whales. He finds them by putting a microphone in the ocean and listening for their sonar clicks. They make the loudest sounds that are made by any living thing. You can hear them from about five miles away. And what that means is that they are vibrating a sphere of water with a 10 mile diameter. That is a lot of power. So we drop a microphone and we listen to them. They of course are very sparse in the ocean. Uh, they, they come and they go, but often they are not there. They do like these waters and often they are there, but there's no telling where we will meet them at first or who we will meet at first. So and they spend about 50 minutes out of every hour of their lives looking for food or going down and coming back up. They, they look for food about 3000 feet below the surface. Say that again, how many feet? 3,000 feet. Uh -huh. And a lot of that uh, food is plankton and uh, as well as other food? What uh, does well, that They mean? eat big squid. Ah, oh, big squid. Sperm whales are the only big whale with teeth. Mm -hmm. And when they're hunting, they're actually hunting. Hmm. They're not filtering. Wow. And, um, and they find the squid by their echoes because 3,000 feet down, there's no light. So they emit these sonar clicks and that's how they find their food. And then they, um, then they, you know, they come to the surface because they have to breathe. But when they have babies, the babies cannot go down there. And babies are totally defenseless at the surface. If killer whales show up, they, they, um, they have no way to resist killer whale attack. Mm -hmm. So somebody needs to stay with the baby and sperm whales have permanent family groups. That is basically a babysitting culture. They have to know whose baby belongs to whom so that if the mother goes down, somebody will stay with the baby, either the mother's sister or, um, or, or one of their daughters or somebody like that. Their social organization is very much like African elephants in that regard. But the mother has to take these very, very long trips many times a day to look for food. 
So we drop the microphone, we listen and we move. And uh, so far we have failed to find any whales. And after some interval of time that I'm not closely keeping, our boat is again undulating across the massage of long swells mm -hmm. to the next spot where we will again listen to the sounds of the deep sea. The blue gray sea is slick and hazy bright it is both instantaneous and eternal. So one, one, one question, I'm just curious, are you, um, are you trying to show any slides or pictures at this time? No. Okay, great, no. I just wanted to make sure, go ahead, I'm, sorry. I'm just reading a passage. I think, that, I think the problem is that if I show a slide, uh, let me try to do that, I think then my manuscript disappears on me, so. Um, what are you seeing right now? Uh, w nothing. Uh, wait a second. Yeah. Wow. They're, they're, uh, yeah, they're the whales. Wow. Yep, there they are. Wow, that's wonderful. Okay, now the, the problem is I can't get my manuscript back. I'm happy to uh, see you. Move your, <laughs> instead of optimizing your screen, move your screen to a smaller optimization. So you'll see up in the corner, up on the upper right hand corner, and then you'll be able to see your manuscript. So click that, uh, click that view option where the arrow is there, and I think you'll be brought back. No? Uh, what are you seeing right now? Uh, we still see the whales. You don't see the text? No, nothing. Nothing okay. at all. Well, no. in that case, that's kind of perfect. Good. So <laughs> let, me, let me keep reading along in this passage that I'm sharing with you. Please. The blue-gray sea is slick and hazy bright. It is both instantaneous and eternal. We travel in small ecstatic sparks of time. We transit in and out of the company of flying fish, of terns. The sea, glittering, rolls like a carpet of short blue flames. Something like time must be passing, but I feel suspended in an infinite moment that seems to vibrate in place. Perhaps from the whales, I've learned something about living. At this stop, listening to his headphones, Shane raises one finger. He hears whales, more than one. Their sonar goes tick, tick, tick. One whale goes silent. She has stopped hunting. Over the next few minutes, others also silence their sonars. From two or 3,000 feet below the waves, in the frigid blackness where they earn their livings, they are coming up, 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 a few minutes later, the dark heads and backs of two whales shatter the harsh sparkle of the sea like tiny newborn islands, the coastline of their bodies generating their own surf. Their white puffs drift on the distance. I listen to them clicking out their clacking codes of recognition, announcing themselves as individuals, announcing their family membership, announcing the clan in which they claim membership. They are braiding their messages of bonding and belonging. Their sound, highly styled, is percussive and precise, like castanets. As I listen, the codas go in and out of phase with each other. Sometimes they're perfectly separated. Sometimes they completely overlap, like conversations at a busy table. Three others burst the surface, so a total of five up now. And what I'm left with is this impression. A whale is too big to see. At a time, you get pieces. Now the head, now the back, now the flukes, but never the whale. In Rome once, I said to my wife, Patricia, we've now seen Michelangelo's painting of the creator, but what would the creator's own painting of creation look like? I think that is easy to answer now. It is these whales in this sea. The whales that this ocean has brought forth seem in their pacing and their scale to reflect the enormity of all things past and present. When they all dive, I put on the headphones and I'm amazed at how loud they are. For a couple of minutes, I listen to their affirmations, these short repeated code words, and then the rally subsides. She just focused her sonar on us, says Shane, still listening. Now she's traveling down. 
Focused sonar comes in very fast strings of clicks that are called click trains, sometimes more than 600 clicks per second, and they sound to us like a buzz. Then they switch to the business of searching. Their echolocation clicks begin coming into my ears. Tick, tick, tick. With time now for a break, most of our crew takes the opportunity to jump into the water. Put your head under, you can hear the whales. Vibrating an enormous sphere of water around them, they sound saturate the ocean as they level off perhaps a thousand meters down. Journalist James Nestor got eye to eye with sperm whales in the Indian Ocean and noted, I heard a thunderous crack, then another, so loud they vibrated my chest. Two sperm whales emerged from the shadows, scanning us to see if we were a threat. Within just a few feet of the mother, the click patterns changed, becoming softer and slower. They sounded to me like the sound sperm whales used to identify themselves to others in the pod. The whales were probably introducing themselves. They were saying, hello. All right, thank you. That's wonderful. So sperm whales have these mother cultures and they live in these families and the families live in what are called clans. The, the reason that they have these clan cultures is that clans are families that do things the same way. They travel similar distances from shore, they travel um, either, either more straight or more zigzaggy, they travel either faster or slower, but all the families in the clan do it the same way. And one of the things that culture does, one of the main things that culture does, is it brings individuals together into a group. With sperm whales, it's a family where everybody knows one another and families form a clan where everybody does things the same way. But then the other thing that culture very much does is it keeps the groups apart. Individuals come together as groups, groups stay apart. They avoid each other. Sometimes they just avoid each other. Sometimes uh, with some species, groups are actively very hostile to members of other groups. And this I think is where the understanding of what culture is in species across the board, which is the answer to the question of how do we live here? What are the things we do to live here? That question differs from one cultural group to the next. And when cultural groups try to meet or try to mingle, a lot of confusion often occurs. Think of human groups where people speak a different language. They can't really cooperate because they don't understand one another. Expectations differ. If you go to shake somebody's hand, but they're expecting you to bow and they bow, it's, it's an awkward moment. You, you haven't cooperated in doing things the same way so that you understand what is going on between the two of you. This is um, something that works really well because if you, if you try to mix things up, everybody gets confused. But at this stage in human history, humans are very mixed together and yet we can't seem to get past our impulses to avoid or be hostile to other groups. Mm. So this is something that's pretty common with cultures among animals, but it's something about culture that is now very much working against us as human beings trying to get along and cooperate uh, mm -hmm. and just and just survive on planet earth right uh, yeah, so we're still seeing your we're still still seeing your screen curl with the whales just so yes. you know i yeah. wanted to i wanted to actually um comment on this a little bit um especially uh with respect to, I, I highlighted a sentence in your book. Uh, in the beginning, you say, to see things as they are requires honesty. And, and, and that's what I, I like about your work and how you speak, because 
you're basically uh, implying, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, globalization is, is really the, a big part of the problem we're, we're experiencing on Earth right now. And we've also been sidetracked. We must be very honest about um, having taken many wrong turns in terms of corporate culture. So the, the, we live in a non-sustaining fashion. So indigenous wisdom or any of the life-sustaining practices have sort of been erased by corporate profit and fueled by cash in, a, in that. And now we're here and what do we do? How do we, you know, how do we try to find our way back uh, before it's too late? Right. Well, one of the things about being honest anyway is that humans have told themselves a lot of stories about us that are, uh, that are not true. We've told ourselves that we are perfected. We've told ourselves that we are most, the most valuable thing in the world. And that, and we've told ourselves that the entire world is here to serve us. None of those things are actually true. And they are causing catastrophes that are literally killing the world. We are in an extinction crisis right now where, you know, you may have heard of endangered species and you know that some species are at risk of going extinct, but almost every free living species in the world um, and all the habitats they live in, just think of as a proxy for all the species, think of forests and grasslands, rivers, coral reefs, the ocean, uh, the rainforests. All of these habitats are at their smallest or most degraded that they've ever been. And along with them, everything that lives in there is at their lowest population numbers that they have ever been. And that's because we are taking the world away from them. But at the same time, we're taking the world we are starting to weaken the life support systems and destabilize the life support systems that we very much count on and that our agriculture counts on. What is going around is beginning to come around in a big way. Our incredible abuse of animals, not just use, but incredible abuse of animals is why we're on a Zoom call. Right. It created the pandemic. <laughs> that is now out of control. Uh, you, you know, you don't get a pandemic from eating tofu. You get a pandemic from having live animal markets where animals that are not really a normal part of the human food supply and would never meet each other in their normal ranges are jammed up against each other in filthy crowded conditions that are the perfect viral test tubes for viruses to experiment with new little tweaks to themselves to see what else in the world they can conquer. And they have hit the jackpot finding a species with 8 billion potential victims. That's us. Um, and that's because of our incredible abuse of these animals around us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. these, are, like these are some of the disasters that come from the, the mythologies that we tell ourselves that unlike some mythologies that help us understand ourselves, the, these mythologies help us misunderstand ourselves and the entire rest of the world. And of course, these mythologies are cultural. Right. I'd like to uh, sort of uh, echo that, uh, you know, as we move from a hunter-gatherer society uh, to a more uh, agrarian society about 8,000 years ago. And I think we're, we're destined to move more that way if we're going to survive. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, a quote that came in, a uh, question I think is more of a statement, do, do, to what extent is capitalism with its lack of empathy a form of animal abuse, human and otherwise? And uh, Hilda responded saying, we live in a corporate culture, not life-sustaining culture. Globalization merged original indigenous cultures that are drowning in credit debt and fueled by cash flow which is incredibly uh, poignant when you think about it uh, from the view of, you know, we are caught up in the systemic, uh, the systemic uh, 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 farming uh, of, of animals as well as industrial uh, agriculture. 
And then that also fuels uh, cortisol and it fuels a, 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 a diet that is not nutrient rich or nutrient based. And that of course uh, 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 negates a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion that we might otherwise see uh, with our shared DNA brethrens in the animal world. Your thoughts about that? Do you agree with that? Do you have a sense of that yourself? Well, um, yeah, I have. I certainly have thoughts about it. I I would one hundred percent agree with the idea that our economic system is killing the world and making uh, causing a tremendous amount of human suffering. So I'm I'm not in the least a fan of the system, but but it's not the system if what you mean is capitalism. Any system delivers on its values. Mm -hmm. You could have compassionate capitalism. In fact, there are impact investors who move money around to benefit people. Wow. There, there are people who have started large banks whose entire rationale is to improve the status of women by giving women small loans to, to, to um, help them get to independence and start businesses and things like that. It's the values, the, the, the rapacious values that have turned capitalism into basically a macerator. But mm -hmm. if you look at communism or, or so whatever you call, you know, what the Chinese call communism or what the Soviets called their form of socialism, those economic systems also destroyed the natural, uh, the, the natural attributes of those countries. Um, they, they polluted horribly. They were incredibly rough on their own people. Um, you know, as we see right now with what China is doing to Hong Kong, for instance, or its or its ridiculous stand on Taiwan, and you know, th th that is they're not a, they don't call themselves a capitalist country, but the values are uh, there's something deeply wrong with with the human psych psychology that um, allows basically uh, basically very abusive men to become the most dominant individuals in our society. And we have this very much in common with chimpanzees. Hmm. So chimpanzees are another creature that I focused on in my book that we're here to talk about. Are you seeing chimpanzees? Not yet. Oh, there they are. Yes, we see them now. Very, okay. uh, very good. So you see three chimps, right? Yes. Oddly enough, I'm, I'm not seeing what I'm showing you and, and it's hampering my ability to know what I'm doing here. But these are three male chimps that are, um, the one on the left is the highest ranking chimp in that community. Chimpanzees always have a male as the most dominant member. The male that is most dominant always wins uh, a fight to get to the most dominant position. And then he uses his dominance to suppress others around him. And um, the one immediately to the right of that one, the one in the middle, mm -hmm. was a contender for dominance. He <laughs> lost. And the one in the back is um, somebody who is up and coming and may, in fact, be a, a violent rival of the one on the left at some point. So they, they're all friends. They, they have an uneasy kind of friendship. Chimpanzees and humans are, are very rare in the animal kingdom as individuals where murder is a, is a regular part of their society. They may know somebody for 20 years and then kill them. Uh, only humans and chimpanzees seem to do these things. Mm -hmm. Our other equally closely related living relative is another ape that looks a lot like chimpanzees. It's called a bonobo. Their most dominant individual is always a female. 
females are not obsessed with oppressing people around them. And in bonobo society, the females use their dominance to suppress violence. Hmm. In chimpanzees, the males use violence to assert their dominance. Hmm. Those two things are very, very different. My impression among the chimpanzees is that they make their lives a lot less pleasant than they need to be. Hmm. And the bonobos do the experiment. You look at the, the other ape that's about the same size, equally related to us, also lives in rainforests in Africa, although the, the ranges do not inter, uh, overlap. Hmm. And when you look at bonobos, the, the, re the only researcher who has really spent a lot of time studying both in the wild says bonobos always seem to be enjoying life. Hmm. Chimpanzees never seem to be completely relaxed. Any totally relaxed interval can erupt into complete chaos in a split second. But it's very different with bonobos. And I think that we've just had the very bad luck yeah. of evolving a social system that is a lot more like chimpanzees than it yeah. is like bonobos. Well, we've got 99% of our DNA, uh, which is similar. So it's... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's we're no equally order. related to, yeah. to both of them. Yeah. We just went down a certain path. And I think it's possible to get locked into that path. We are probably unique in being able to try to observe ourselves and ask these questions, but we're, we're really strangers to ourselves. We don't really understand why we have these impulses. And that and, that and our, uh, we're really not very motivated to get beyond these impulses, creates a, a, a lot or all of the social problems that we cannot seem to conquer generation after generation. Mm. The progress that we make is excruciatingly yeah. slow. Um, we go a few steps forward, we backtrack, um, and we still have these problems that we talk about every single day. Mm. And right. it, seems, oh. it seems like the only way forward is to uh, really deepen our spiritual life in terms of cultivating compassion, or that's the only path out of this meth mess. But I have, uh, Lily uh, has, a, has her hand raised digitally here. So I wanna um, unmute Lily and if you would uh, yep. join and everybody feel welcome to ask questions as I, I would like this to feel interactive and everyone's voice to be heard. Lily, do you have a, a video? Um, it's not on right now. I'll go turn it on. Yeah, I, lo I love seeing everybody. Hi, <laughs> Lily. You had a question? Um, do you believe that the current state of unregulated capitalism almost incentivizes climate destruction? And if so, what could be done to counteract that? Mm. Great question. Well, capitalism is very regulated, but it's not regulated enough in the right ways. So I wouldn't call it unregulated. I would, I would call it out of control. And it incentivizes almost every bad thing you can imagine because there was a court case in the early 20th century in which two people who worked for Henry Ford, two brothers whose last name was Dodge and they went on to create their own auto company, the Dodge Cars and Trucks, they sued Henry Ford because Ford's idea of what he was trying to do was to share the profits with his workers as a way to help everybody have uh, a better material life. The Dodge brothers wanted a lot more of the profits themselves and they sued Ford and the lawsuit turned on the question of what is the purpose of a corporation. The judge could have sided with Henry Ford and said the purpose of a corporation is to use the profits to improve the community. But the judge sided with the Dodge brothers and said the purpose of a corporation is to return maximum profits to shareholders. This was a catastrophe that has taken on planetary significance. Now that was in the United States and I'm not sure whether corporate culture would have evolved differently, but basically the United States sent its corporate culture global. And then when our country started to 
make tremendous gains in workers' rights through unions, unions which won rights often uh, at the expense of tremendous violence and incredibly incredible ugliness. And uh, then environmental regulations. Well, unions demanded better wages, better working conditions. Unions cost more. And environmental regulations uh, uh, make the corporation essentially pay for the cost of pollution before the pollution gets out and society in general has to pay for it. So what have corporations from America done? They have left America and taken themselves mostly to com countries where there are no unions, workers are treated terribly, there are no environmental regulations, nobody can breathe the air, nobody can get out of poverty. So a lot of terrible things are incentivized by the way we conduct our capitalism, not by capitalism, but by the way we do it with the values that we insist it work based on. And now because it's that way, any companies that try to do better things are at an economic disadvantage. They have to have higher prices. So of course, most people don't want to pay higher prices. And that's why you can buy things that should cost a lot more if the workers were paid better and the plants were not polluting uh, you can buy them incredibly cheaply in these big box stores where everything comes from uh, mostly China, which has nothing like the environmental safeguards or the worker rights or the human rights or the free speech or anything that we have. But freedom costs money. Community well-being costs money. It, it costs money because, we're, we're, because it, it involves sharing. Who does it cost money of it costs money of greedy people who want it all for themselves. So and Carl, then if, if you try to compete with them, you're at a disadvantage. So yes, the incentives are, are, are all going in the wrong direction and you can see the results of that everywhere around us. So yes. Carla, what, what I hear you saying is that you're not, uh, you're not uh, disagreeing or out of favor with capitalism per se, but you are out of favor with uh, uh, capitalism that is not conscious or compassionate capitalism as a means of uh, not only taking care of society, but taking care of uh, the environment and the world around it. Yeah, and, and, I, you and, yeah. could have capitalism that involves, you know, being an entrepreneur or, or even getting loans or, or getting, you know, venture capital. You could have it if, if the purpose was we're going to make everything better for everybody by using the profits of our company and sharing them. But it's ridiculous that people who do nothing and don't even know what stocks they're holding are, are making money that was earned by workers in a company. Yes. And, the and I, don't I get the money. And we can really actually, I enjoy working with youth uh, or children because they haven't started paying taxes yet. Um, and, um, in very simple terms, the Gaia hypothesis is, is looking at Earth as a self-regulatory system. So um, if we look at, there's the daisy world model. Uh, for the longest time, we lived in these aerobic conditions where, and Earth uh, kept regulating its temperature through the greenery, even if the sun kept burning you know, stronger, but now there seems to be a complete disconnect with all these Ivy League schools out there that we can't keep deforesting and acidifying the ocean if we want to help Earth continue cooling down this habitat that we have. So how do we um, make that connection clear to um, the corporate world? It's interesting. It's so well, simple. It's it's, it's very simple. And obviously, the, there are very greedy people who have only their own very short term interests, and they have bankrolled a, a toxic and disastrous um, disinformation campaign that comes to us mostly in the form of Fox News that has created uh, a, a cultural disconnect and a, and a disability to actually get information so that you only get one side and live in an echo chamber. When, when I was young, 
there was a thing called the Fairness Doctrine. Almost nobody remembers the Fairness Doctrine. Ronald Reagan did away with the Fairness Doctrine, which led directly to the ability of something like Fox News to happen. This was all a very, a very well-plotted long-term strategy. The Fairness Doctrine said, you're using the public airwaves. They belong to the public. If you have an opinion that is a political opinion or a policy opinion, you have to have a balanced opposing broadcast so that both opinions and both sides of the argument must, you are required, if you're gonna do this on the air, you must have both. And when I was a kid and I listened to the radio, if I was in the car listening to the news on the radio, they'd have the news and they'd have some editorial that they think something should happen. And they would literally say, and now for the responsible opposing viewpoint, we have so-and-so. So you were forced to hear both sides of an argument. You could still figure out which one you liked, but you were forced to hear both. And nobody could get away with just lying, 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 like they get away with it now. Yeah, and I think Marshall has a comment right now. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, it seems like uh, over time we've been you know, converted uh, really into animals, uh, consumers. Uh, we, we're, we can't make our own things anymore. Um, and so uh, I think uh, we're at a very, a very interesting juncture, actually, where we're becoming aware of uh, these um, narratives that, that, um, that now script us, uh, the, our ideological narratives, uh, um, and, and so obviously we're, we're awash in propaganda. Um, and uh, we, we're now looking at our, 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 our racial history. Everything is, everything is bubbled up and on the table, and we need to have these... Uh, modalities of healing, whether it's uh, uh, yoga or, or meditation, or I'm really into Myers-Briggs now, or uh, psychohistory. I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, runaway narcissism. And, uh, you know, we need to understand how that's operated throughout history. And it's, oh, they've always been here, they, the emotional vampires, the, the exploiters, the people have no empathy. And in times of uh, tyranny, they, they rise to the top and all the other narcissists you know, a junior narcissist around them, and they say, well, you know, we don't need to regulate everything. The market will take every, everything. And so the capitalism is not, is not the problem so much as uh, neoliberalism, which uh, externalized uh, all our costs onto the rest of the world, and we were just supposed to ignore all that. And so as, as a consequence, we have um, billions upon billions of animals suffering around the world, and, and people are joining with them in that. And, um, uh, this we need to take this moment as as a real awakening, as um, a return to empathy. Um, we need to um, uh, re-embrace uh, our native habitats and reconnect. And I guess fortunately, because we're all stuck, all at, stuck home, at home, we, we really ha have a chance of re-engaging with nature again. Can Can I just add a, a quick thought? Um, I, w I wonder, you know, if the Earth had a billion people instead of eight billion people. Um, it, it, it may not matter if we had this mentality that we have now in our economic systems where, oh, I need to, um, you know, I need to profit as much as possible. Um, but when we've gotten to the point with such a large human population, uh, you know, way back when there was this cornucopian idea of the earth is here for us, it's resources for our use, and it kind of didn't matter that that was our view because there weren't that many of us, you know, using using things on such a wide scale. Well, that's like saying that there's only a few COVID cases, so you don't have to worry about it. I mean, if it's already baked in the mentality, it's an, an inevitability. Right. It's just going to change but, what you think of thinking, you know. But yeah, but the but point it's that, true that one billion people cannot cause the same amount of damage as nine billion people. Right, but the point that I want to make is, you know, I, I think it was Da Vinci said, if you want to invent something, look to nature for inspiration, and if if we were able to create, you know, look at at nature and say, all right, nature sustains itself forever, ever, 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 ever. It can go on and on and on without our interference. Wouldn't it be beautiful if we could craft an economic system that was a steady state rather than based on, you gotta grow the economy, you gotta grow. There's nothing in the universe other than the universe 
that continues to expand infinitely. We're, we're, we're smart enough to do this. We can actually build a sustainable planet. We just got to decide that's what we want to do. I don't think we're smart enough to decide that is, is what I think is the terrible reality. I think well, collectively we don't have what it takes. There well, are limits so, so far to you're right. I think, I think Peter has a comment. I see him, I see oh. him, uh, bub it's bubbling up. <laughs> well, I think um, my question was about um, the leadership because uh, we, we have been talking about how the chimpanzees, they order yeah, this. The, 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 the bonobos, I, I, I see your question. The bonobos, um, females have coalitions. They support one another. Hmm. They're, they're supportive. The most dominant bonobo is not really that dominant. And, and often it's uh, something that is just earned by uh, the respect of, a, of an elder female, which is true really of, of all the ones, of all the species that have the most dominant individual being female. It's usually just the oldest one. She just gets to be the highest ranking because people respect what she knows from experience and they follow her. It's not that, it's not, they don't enforce their dominance. They earn it and mm. they simply get it from everybody right and there's uh there there is some implicit um uh, aspects of our nature which i i think are very nurturing compassionate uh we have a compassion deficit uh, uh in our culture right now we are a very mechanized culture and i think also our diet and uh the enrich uh, what happens with our diet uh, really helps to inform us in terms of our uh compassion and our care in terms of the environment, certainly what we're doing to animals is is is, is just horrible. Um, so there is a, a a statement here. I think Steve brought it in. We need more women running running the governments, and certainly that latest thing that we saw, where the governments that are run by women have uh, fewer COVID cases. Uh, and I don't know if that's true or whether or not that's a piece of fake news, but I'd like to believe it. Uh, I certainly have seen uh, some of the stats. Um, this has been an incredibly rich uh, conversation, uh, incredibly rich, Carl, and uh, I, I think we can all stay on here for hours yes. discussing the, the, the conversation. Uh, and I, would, I would love to, Keith, I see Lily has her hand up again yes. because she's the one uh, who is inheriting this mess we've made, so I'd like her to have the, the final one. word instead sure. of me. Lily. Lily has something to say. Thank you. Um, do you believe that veganism is a successful and potentially like useful way in mitigating climate change? And how much of an impact do you think it could have if more people cut back meat? Uh, well, you said cut back meat and you said veganism. So those are two very different <laughs> things. Plant-based uh, versus I, veganism. So let's I, go plant-based. I, I understand the question. Thank you. Um, I, I, just, uh, I just have to be a little cheeky from time to time. But I, have to, I also have to point out, you know, we, we need to disentangle our concepts to get clear about what we're talking about. So first of all, eating meat has horrible consequences planetarily. There is the unbelievable amount of suffering straight out, first of all. There is the incredible amount of destruction of and poisoning of land to simply grow the food or to fish out the oceans to feed cows, pigs, and chickens. Uh, gigantic amounts of forests have been destroyed in South America to grow recently in my lifetime and maybe the last 40 years. The whole, the whole eastern part of Brazil, it was called the Atlantic Dry Forest Region, to grow soybeans not to make tofu, but to feed farm animals, mostly in Europe and in the United States. So, uh, and all of that creates, uh, well, all of that also um, propels the extinction crisis forward at an ex a very much accelerating rate. So everything about producing and eating meat has negative consequences. And the worst ways that it's done with these intensive concentration camps have the worst consequences. Mm. I don't really like isms applied to practices and behaviors. Um, I don't really like ideologies. I don't really like inflexibility 
I, I was raised uh, to believe an ism that I, I came to believe was completely false. And so I don't like calling it veganism. A vegan diet is what I like calling it. And yes, that is by far the better thing to do. Now, a, a very closely related question then for me, since I'm blabbing on and on about this so sanctimoniously is, am I vegan? And the answer is, I'm not vegan. And here's, here's the, what my diet is about. And in fact, if you wanna see more about this and my rationale, I wrote an article called What I Eat by Carl Safina. You can look it up. Uh, I haven't bought animal meat to cook at home for my whole adult life from the, first, from the time basically I was living on my own. I, I think that we raise animals and make them live much worse than we make them die. And I don't wanna have anything to do with that. I don't wanna have anything to do with all the environmental destruction of that system. But there's another thing is that I live on the coast and I grew up fishing and I still have access to what is really good food with fish and clams and shellfish that I can get myself. I don't really like the idea that every single thing I eat is going to be shoved at me across a counter and I have to pay for it. I like having a personal relationship with my food supply. I don't have a very good vegetable garden. I actually need to improve my uh, my garden and my farming skills. My backyard right now has much too much shade to have a really good garden, and I don't want to cut the trees down. Um, and I can go fishing and I can have this food. And I, I say that a good meal has a story. If you can sit around the table and tell people how you grew this thing, what your garden was like, where you found these fish, how you caught them, that to me is is a good meal with good food. And, it, and, and that is important to me. And um, so I, I do hold on to that. And I enjoy fishing. I don't enjoy killing the fish and I don't enjoy having the fish die. I try to kill them quickly and be humane in that way. The difference between fishing and farming is like the difference between farming and natural predation, which is a free living animal gets to be who it is supposed to be right up until the time a predator grabs it. A farmed animal never gets to be who it's supposed to be and usually lives miserably. There were farms where animals didn't live that miserably all the time, but those are few and far between. They've mostly been pushed out of existence and priced out of existence for all the reasons we've been talking about. So I think it's, I think it's, very, I think it's very appropriate, Carol, that uh, you read this poem uh, that was put up uh, called The Fish by Elizabeth Bishop. And uh, I know that was uh, one of the things that was asked uh, in our uh, chat box. Yes. And, uh, Lori yeah, had to leave, so she's yeah, I, I'm going to make a note to look that up. I'm, I, the, the name and the author is familiar, but I don't remember anything about how the poem goes, so I'm going to refresh. Yeah, we, we are so wild. We're wild kids. We're way over time. Yeah. We we're becoming wild. wild. We're, we're, we, we're going to, here by, we're going to make this um, um, segment a, a one hour segment to yep. just stay true yep. to time. We're at one and, hour. We're at yes. one hour for sure. Yeah, we're at one hour, but we'll stay on for an informal chat, but we must stop the recording before yes. we, you know. Uh, All right, well, I'm, I'm willing to say thank you everybody for joining me this morning. It's really been a treat, very, uh, very lively discussion. We, 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 in a way, got off the main topic of cultures of free living wild animals, but in another way, I think we understand more fully the implications of what our own animal culture is, yes. and uh, and what it uh, and the, and the problems that it is causing for us. Yes. And Carl, can you tell us uh, again the name of the book and how we can, how people can reach you if they want to reach you? The, I, the name of the book, as you see right there, is Becoming Wild. Yes. And you can reach me at safinacenter.org. You could go to my website, carlsafina.org. I'm around. And before, before we end, I would like to introduce our new friend, Frederica, who oh, yes, has a Frederica. background. Where is your background? Where is that? Is that Frederica. Iceland? Hello, I'm Frederica Foster. I'm so happy to meet you all. And I'm a 
painter and the photographer and my primary subject matter right now is water and I can't believe I get to be introducing myself where Carl Safina, one of my great heroes oh, for the I... work you have done with the ocean. I just cannot thank you enough. Oh, and, thank you um, very much. I believe very strongly that art is a form of direct mental targeting and that by targeting positive emotions and causing people to experience connection, we can make change. I think we're seeing what happens when the world is led by fear and mm. it's really ugly. Mm. So my work has been focused around using images that I make of water, my own personal connection with water, trying to think as water, since we are all water beings, mm. that change can happen this way. And I've had experience with different institutions. I have evidence for this. Mm. So, And you're going to be joining us next week, Fred Frederica. And I it's so agree. wonderful that John Halpern introduced you to us. And I read your article in Tricycle Magazine. And I've uh, been and I did a little bit of research and seen some of your work and I'm really so honored. I just want to say also so honored uh, to have you on and we look forward to hearing from you next week. And Carl, Carl, uh, just thank you very much for bringing us all together with our native uh, world, uh, with a life that uh, sustains us and we need to really be more compassionate and caring for that because in that we care for ourselves. Thank you, and I would I would also agree that a great a great agent of change is art, and that's why artists are often considered so dangerous. <laughs> so, let us all stay wild, and let well, us all. Haven't met John Harpern yet, so you're you're right on you're right on cue there. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> great. Yes, yes for cultural activism, we love that. Very okay. good stuff. So uh, we'll, uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, for being here and we'll look forward to seeing you next week at uh, Your Environment yeah, Now, Yen at 10. And this is Keith Fiveson with the Center for Wellbeing and the Work Mindfulness Project. Thanking you so much for being here with us. Ciao. Thanks. Bye.